Hello, hello, happy Wonderland Wednesday. Welcome to Allison's Wonderland, the show that takes you through the looking glass into the wild and wonderful world of animation and games. I feel like it's been more than a week. It feels like it's been a while. So I'm glad to be back here with you guys. And I wanna say big thank you to everyone that's joining live, like Jeffrey, Peyton, Michael Meyer, Sebastian, the whole gang's here, Hunter, hey Rocky Rod, more Kismet, good to see your face. Ooh, you guys were in for such a treat tonight. Our guest is Christy Reed. I have been wanting to have Christy on the show since before uh, we launched, and so I'm so excited to have her on tonight. She's a three-time Emmy Award-nominated uh, voice and casting director, so she really covers the gamut. She's worked on such shows like Centaur World, um, Infinity Train. She's working on the new Little Ellen, uh, Vampirina, of course, We Bear Bears, uh, Summer Camp Island, and so many more. So I'm so excited to bring her on and really dive deep into what it takes to become uh, a casting director and voice director for animated movies and television and just how she manages to bring the best performances out of her cast. So please welcome with me the one and only Christy Reed. Let's make sure she's here. Okay. There she is. Okay, guys, I want, oh wait, look, I even picked this up my son's little thing. Put your hands together. <laughs> I feel like maybe I'm like a hack comedian from the 1940s sometimes. <laughs> you doing some Catskills comics? Yeah, you know, I'll be here You're all week, fun. so. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Christy, how are you? I'm well, thanks for having me on your show. Thanks for coming on the show. We're so excited. Um, actually, I've been getting a lot of requests to have you on the show. And I kind of wanted to like, make sure I knew what I was doing before I invited you on. And <laughs> since we've never met either, I just wanted to make sure that like, you know, we kind of ironed out any kind of weirdness that was happening. But we haven't met, so we're gonna iron it all out live in front of everybody. Yeah, yeah. Oh, There'll I be so many wrinkles of weirdness to iron out, it'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just create new wrinkles because okay. I mean, there's really no other way to do it. So. We work in a weird industry. It's true. I always say it beats getting a real job. Yeah, and I think that's like one of the biggest attractions for me is like pretty much everybody that works in animation is like, I don't know, like uh, really cool or special in some kind of way. If it's uniquely talented or a little bit weird or yeah, fun. I agree with that, yeah. I think that's one of the things that makes casting for me interesting is finding somebody's weirdness and being able to tap into that. Yeah, and I feel like of all your projects, I really do see a through line of real authenticity and-, and yeah, so I was curious, You, I read that you grew up in a rural community. I was curious, I did. where <laughs> did you grow up? I grew up in a town of 203 people. Um, oh. Yeah, it's small, um, outside of Bakersfield. It's called Edison. Okay. It, my dad's a farmer. It's a small rural town um, in California. It's, um, it is a great place to leave. <laughs> well, it's interesting, though, because you didn't have to go too far to be kind of right in the hub of Los Angeles. It's true. Although my path to Los Angeles was global. <laughs> I didn't go straight from there to, to Los Angeles. I went to International University for my undergraduate and I studied in San Diego, London, Nairobi, Kenya. And then I went and did my undergraduate and then I, ended, I was on the East Coast for a bit and then I ended up going to Art Center called to Design in Pasadena and doing an MFA in film there for graduate. So I only came back to LA after I'd really traveled everywhere. Oh my God. And so when you were doing your undergraduate, were you um, interested in filmmaking that or was that something that came about later? No, I was uh, interested in, I was always interested in stories. I was an English major uh, in my undergraduate and I've always loved stories. In my last semester of undergraduate, I had a professor throw at me the studying screenwriting as a form of literature. And I was like, oh, why do I like movies? I like, oh, I like this idea. And then I got more into it and that just led into studying screenwriting and then I started studying screenwriting I was like well I want to direct and so that led to where we're at you know it caught and that I mean when I think about there wasn't a ton of female directors there's so many more now than there were you know say 20 30 years ago 20 years yeah. ago um did that was that a difficult path for you at the time did were people skeptical sure. 
Yeah, there's definitely things where you're like, well, I don't know, you know, and I'm a gay woman. So I was like, well, you know, I don't know if they were going to even let me in the door in some of these places. So and sometimes you just had to just have the confidence that you're just going to do it and see what happens. And you may, and it may fall flat in your face, but at least you tried. So, yeah, for sure. Do you feel that it, it built resilience having to, you know, put on war paint? and? Yeah, I think what it built was the... I can't worry what someone's going to think of me. I have to be my authentic self because if I try to be anybody else, it's going to just stink like, you know, like the, the person who's trying to be inauthentic. And so I had to just be my real self and hope that the world either embraced it um, or was willing to give me a try. So it, I, it, I had to. I, didn't, I don't think I had a choice. I can't pretend to be a straight person. Um, so I just had to go into the room and say, hey, you know, I'm this gay woman who wants a job. And then hope that there was somebody who said, okay, and, and, and would work on it and, and, and follow through on it. This was like in the 90s. So yeah, there's been such a huge trajectory since then. Yeah. And you've really, I mean, been uh, a role model for I'm sure a lot of women, both gay and straight, that are have worked their way through the ranks and come up. And what you've been able to create in your career has been super inspiring. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> so uh, I know that you started uh, your directing career actually directing commercials. I did. So that was one of those things where so I went to film school and commercials was an easier way to get into the industry at the time. And so I made a commercial reel and I went and I started directing commercials and I quickly realized, holy shit, I made a terrible mistake. The advertising world is terrible. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I was like, what have I done? Oh, my God. And commercial so, yeah i was like oh my god i don't know if i can get this passionate about a box of cheerios but damn it i'll try and i couldn't <laughs> so um i happen to know at the same time a guy who was starting a studio his name is eric sherman and he was starting bang zoom and he was just he and i had i worked a little bit of indie film at the same time as i was doing commercials because that was always where i wanted to go and he was also just a new screenwriter at that time and we ended up crossing paths and he said hey um, I'm doing this thing. I've got this recording studio and I, you know, come and voice direct like an anime, like it's like a four episode thing. And the time I was like, mm, I don't know, it's not really what I was thinking I was going to do. Mm -hmm. And so I went and had this other commercial and it was terrible. It was a horrible, horrible experience. And I called, Hey, Eric, so that job, you might want to, you know, is that still an opportunity? And he's like, yeah, come on in. And so I did a four episode, uh, OVA for Bang Zoom. And I was uh -huh. like, Oh, this is where I belong padded wall people come in in a temperature controlled environment in their pajamas just low low egos and we just got straight to work and i was like oh yeah this is this is where i belong and so that way led to anime the video games which led eventually to cartoon network and doing original animation there. and so when you when you started at bang zoom was that a dubbing job or were you totally it was a dubbing job anime yeah i was dubbing a show called idol project was the very first thing i ever did um and it was four episode OVA that I started on and um, and then just kind of went from there. And, but I realized immediately that my sensibilities really kind of uh, keyed in where I was. Yeah. And so from anime then, um, were you a fan of anime before you even started directing anime? I read somewhere that your um, commercials were somewhat anime inspired at times. They were, they were <laughs> definitely animation inspired. I okay. think it's safe to say. Um, I've always had sensibilities that works for animation. My stuff has always been um, a little bit hyper reality kind of stuff than my commercials that I would do. Uh, so, and there has been sort of a commercial sensibility and timing to it. Um, anime, I, I, I have a very conflicted relationship with anime. I think that mm -hmm. anime does a really wonderful thing. I think it treats women terribly sometimes. And so mm -hmm. there would be times I'd just be like, I, uh, anime, we were doing so well. And then you did something and I'm like, yeah, no, she doesn't love her brother. So <laughs> it'd be stuff like that. And so, you know, that, so my goal was to get out of anime, which led to video games, which was a way for me to move forward. And then, but ultimately to get into original animation. And then I did have a chance at Cartoon Network. And the first show I did there was Clarence, which led to Over the Garden Wall, and then We Bear Bears, and then canceled things afterwards. What was it like working on Clarence? Clarence, um, Clarence had a lot of heart. Clarence had a, a bumpy start. Um, but once it got going, everybody on that show wanted it to succeed so badly. And that the authenticity and sincerity in that show just pushed it forward. And that is, I think, why the show was successful, is that everybody 
who was on that show loved everything about it and and made it a successful show. It was and great. did did you both cast and voice direct that show? Yeah, I did. So how how is the difference between projects that you cast? Because some projects you cast and then voice direct, and others you come in just as a voice director. Is that is that different when you don't have say over the casting? Um, I mean, I typically don't have. Uh, I don't have the, the same amount of say I was have as a casting director, but mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm sidelined either. I will definitely pitch ideas and say, you know, let's try this person or, you know, sometimes the showrunner will say, hey, have you worked with so-and-so? You know, what do you think? I'm like, yeah, they're great. Absolutely. Can they do this? I'm like, yes, absolutely. They can do this. So it's, it's different. Um, you know, there is definitely, I think when I do cast a show, I do think that the personality of um, my casting comes through and differently than it would, but that doesn't mean that, that, that there aren't shows where I feel like my personality is in it, even though I didn't cast it. I think Centaur World is a great example of my sensibilities aligning very well with Megan's. We both have a very weird sense of humor that connected in a way that just allowed us to really lean into it and make it a, the fun, weird show that it is. It's so interesting because I absolutely love that show as well. And I'm curious, I watched this TikTok this week that kind of really resonated with me. And it was about comedy and AD, ADD, ADHD. Uh -huh. And um, it's something I was diagnosed with as a kid, but like, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of I'm learning about more as an adult woman. And um, one of the things was that we, we are really uh, have an offbeat or quirky sense of humor. I was wondering, do you have AD, ADD? Or do you relate to any of that? Like, I almost find myself laughing at uh, the setup more than a punchline sometimes because it's like, oh, that's he, they're laying the groundwork, you know? I think I have yeah. anything more of a mild, like, OCD quality. OCD. Like, yeah, I can be very compulsive and linear in certain things. Like, you know, I'm one of these people, I put on my sock, I put on my shoe, I put on my other sock, I put on my other shoe. Do not ask me to break that habit. I'm going to get really annoyed with you. Yeah. So it's stuff like that. Where yeah. I think, yeah, and I think that that lends to your quirkiness because you know that there are just certain ways that you want things to be done and you can appreciate someone else's unique perspective that is completely different than anything you would ever do, but that is in and of itself charming. Yes, and Tamar is timing in like neurodiver <laughs> neurodivergence represents. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And it's like so much of, I was talking about this with Thurup last week, um, Thurup Van Orman, that there is in animation so much more um, divergency and, and neurodivergency and just differences. And we've all for a long time been on the same page of accepting kind of that. And now I feel like the whole world is... <laughs> sort of yeah, getting on sort of getting it well also i think that's one of the things where on i went into animation particularly when i went into cartoon network i was like oh my god i feel so at home because it is it is a world of beautiful weirdos there and that was just like oh my gosh and they just encourage it and they fostered it and it made it this wonderful place to lean into your you know your fragile snowflakeness and and to explore it and i think that you see that in the shows that come out of Cartoon Network. It's interesting though, Cartoon Network in the 90s was still uh, um, very, I mean, even to a certain extent now, uh, more male dominated. Oh, I think. I think everything after Adventure Time is what I'm talking about. Okay, okay, got it, yeah. got it. Yeah. yeah. So what was it like working on Adventure Time? <laughs> um, well, you know, I came in yeah. just in lands after they had done a gazillion episodes. And, mm -hmm, um, right. and so it was one of those things where, you know, I like the show, but I had not seen every single episode. So I, I talked yeah. to Adam Muto and I'm like, so like, give me 15 shows that you think are the kernel of what I need to know about Adventure Time um, as a show and also to do Distant Lands. And it was really interesting because having worked at that point at Cartoon Network for seven or eight years, I knew so many of the people who came from Adventure Time, Rebecca Sugar, and so many people, Cole Sanchez, ah. so many people came from there. And having worked with them on their own shows, I could see a show that Rebecca boarded and be like, oh my God, it's obvious. this is clearly a Rebecca Sugar show. But I would have never been able to see that had I not already done Steven Universe or anything else with the other people and, and gotten to know their sensibilities after Adventure Time to go back and see how present it was in Adventure Time, even when they were just nascently starting out um, as born artists. Ooh, that must be so fun to watch that. Connect it was the dots. awesome. Yeah, connect the dots and see them because 
it, it, you know, it just shows you how much as a creative person, you kind of what we're talking about before, that your whatever your little authenticity spark specialness is, yeah, it comes through even when you're doing someone else's show. So as a director, your specialness, or you're an actor, your specialness is what makes you compelling. And as a casting director, it's what mm-hmm. makes me want to hire you. Is you're not mm-hmm. trying to be like a thousand other voices or whatever. I don't, I, you know, when I audition, yes, I'm going to get 85 people who, write, who do, you know, the exact same thing. I'm listening for that one person who brings their specialness forward and makes it separate and unique. And that's what's <laughs> going to make Sable Key into a character. I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen that before. I want, you know, and I love that character as a consequence. And um, do you feel that you have to go search far and wide? Do you have to often cast a very Sometimes. wide net or do you go, I mean, your agents, they've, they're the ones casting a lot. Yeah, 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 it depends. I mean, I would hope that at this point I've done enough shows where if someone's going to do their research, they're going to kind of key into, like you said, there's sort of, sort of a sensibility that I have. And I hope that that is uh, something that people can key into and that they'll know that I'm not looking for something that's already been done, that I'm yeah. looking for that, that authenticity and that, that uniqueness. So um, sometimes it, I can hear it right away. And um, sometimes I do have to say, no, no, everybody's trying to do what they think is, you know, what this character sounded right. like for the past mm. 40 years. Let's do something different. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And that, do you find that nowadays with casting, you're not really bringing people in? Are you doing callbacks on Zoom or anything like that? Or somebody just... Have it, um, it depends. You know what? I have to say, I really hate casting during the pandemic. Um, yeah. I, I, it's, it sucks. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, so I've actually stopped for the last quarter of this year. I'm only voice directing and taking new voice directing. I'll probably take new casting projects at the beginning of next year, but I actually just kind of hit a wall in August. I'm like, you know what? I need to, I need to take a pause and just kind of stop and, and, and then reevaluate because the human connection and me working with an actor as a casting and a voice director is a vastly different experience of me working with someone over Zoom. It just is. Yeah. Uh, human. <laughs> I know. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh. I this show is actually going to be in 2022 rebooted and we're going to be in studio, so I'm really yeah. excited about. That. Exactly. But I'm like, also nervous. People, like I can't wait to get into the studio. I want. Oh, to I'm going to be the there knocking on the door. The saying, yes, open, open, open. I'm a little bit, yeah, I'm the same. I'm I'm a little bit hesitant that some people, um, you know, it's a much bigger ask to be like, can we come to Burbank or yeah. Culver City yeah. for yeah. a podcast? But, yeah. you know, it, that's, that's. Yeah, that's but if the people want to do, you know, have a, yeah. come across authentically and have a better experience, we'll do it. And the, the energy, the energy in the room. Yeah, absolutely, all of it, the energy in the room. But I mean, the, I mean, it's, it's a collaboration and collaborating via zoom it works but i feel like we could do so much better and yeah i mean this is a little bit of a tangent but i just before this walked my with my son to go get ice cream and i was Mm -hmm. like the world needs to get out more (laughs) like i mean Mm -hmm. not necessarily you know uh, yeah we don't need to go and you know hug a bunch of randos but we need to start kind of coming out of our hidey hole a little bit more and um you know connecting and looking each other in the eye and having those moments as opposed to like trying to like look you in the eye and it's like right exactly (laughs) and i'm like i'm distracted by looking at myself because this is not how conversation should take place i should not see myself when i am talking to other people it's It's distracting what is that that doing to a whole generation i don't know i don't know it can't be good though (laughs) it can't be good Oh, um, I did have a guest ask a question, which kind of dovetails on this. Cole Sanchez, who I hope is on right now. He was oh wondering. God. Cole Sanchez. What about do you know Cole Sanchez? Of course I do. Oh, good. I don't know Cole, but uh, thank you, Cole, for asking this great question, which is, do you have any tips on how to effectively communicate when helping to craft an actor's performance? Cole Sanchez. Um, <laughs> Where's the... <laughs> You guys go way back. Huh? We do go way back. Yes. Um, he's fantastic. He's a wonderful yeah. human being. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, listen, what I try to do when crafting a performance with an actor is, is to meet them off the, as authentically as I can. So, mm-hmm. you know, we talk about how there's a sincerity and authenticity in the, in the casting that I do. I, that's the same thing I want for performances. And the only way that I know how to do that is to just have a straightforward, sincere conversation with the actor in a way that is is vulnerable for me so that I make it okay for the actor to be vulnerable on their end. Mm-hmm. And that is what allows 
I think a good performance to come through. If I can show an actor that I'm willing to be vulnerable with my direction, with where the character is, with my thoughts on it, then I am opening up the room, the energy, the connectivity mm -hmm. to being that for them. So if I am authentic, if I am even times just self-deprecating in my humor to show that, yeah, I fucked up, I made a mistake. So you can do that too, and I'm not gonna judge you. Let's try something, let's be on let's make, take chances. And if you take a chance and go someplace vulnerable and that's magical, my God, mm. thank you. I can't, it's the best I can do and that hope for. So you're like the conduit. You're like the fearless yeah. leader creating that safe space where people can play in the sandbox. I think I'm the conduit for sure. Yeah, I'm the, th I'm the one who says, this is the tone of the room. Let's make it a one where it's fun, where yeah. it's authentic, where it's safe, and it's completely free of judgment. That's amazing. Do you have a ritual that you do uh, or like any kind of daily practice like meditation or? I, <laughs> I do. I meditate twice a day. Nice. What do you have a particular? Um... I do TM. I do 20 TM. minutes in the middle of the day and 20 minutes at the end of the day. That's amazing. I feel when you, you know, just thinking of you as the conduit and when I think about, I feel similarly about performance. It's like you need to clear out the energy and like be able to source yourself from the universe. And that's like one of the only ways to get there, hippie time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's one of those things for me, it's canceling out the noise. So like I, yeah. the way I explain is I, uh, so typically working with the, in animation, you record sessions from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. and then 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. So and they don't always go straight to those things to, you know, to one, sometimes 11 at 12, whatever. But I will meditate after the morning because, you know, whatever happened in the morning, you know, shit happened in the morning, I need to get rid of that. And then <laughs> yeah. shit's gonna happen in the afternoon, so get ready for that. And then once that's done, decompress and that stuff. So it's really, to me, it's canceling up the noise so that I can move on to one thing after another. And then at the end of the day, it's canceling up the noise from the day so that I can be present with my wife and home mm -hmm. and not worry about work. Yeah, I love that. Um, that's like go goals for me would be two times a day. I'm like a one or yeah, 20 but, minutes twice a day. It, 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 I mean, I don't, I would say I make it happen 90% of the time. That's great. How, how long, how, how many years have you been? Yeah, five or six years. Good. Yeah. Yeah. It helps. It really does. It, there was, I could say there has been a marked change in my ability to handle stress, anxiety, sleep, all of it. It's all been wonderful because of it. I highly recommend it. Today's po podcast brought to you by... Hey, by yeah, try this little meditation. Check it out, everybody. <laughs> you get 20% off if you mention Christy Reed. You know, so don't try. <laughs> um, You'll just look foolish. So back to, you know, working on shows like Steven Universe, I was wondering when you co are coming on board, is it pretty, is it pretty daunting then to have to um, direct people in which they've already got their own mojo and their own thing? Or do you find it seamless? Um, it depends. If you're, going to, if you're casting somebody because you know that they um, have their own mojo and their own thing, then you just got to know what their own mojo and their own thing is and, and lean into it and work with it. And you know, I've definitely come in with actors who like, who this is how I do. And I'm like, okay, then this is, then let me figure out a way to make how you do work with how I do and how what we need from the character and hopefully all three of those things will work together and we'll have a nice har harmonious little recording session. Um, and a lot of times I come into, you know, there'll be an actor comes in, this is what I do, and, and I don't know how to do animation. Like I had Chris Isaacs on Over the Garden Wall and he came in um, and he's a lovely and amazing musician. I could tell he was really nervous and it kind of came across with him just being kind of too cool and, you know, and he's kind of walled up. And so mm -hmm. I just was like, okay, I just need to calm you down, man. And let you know that we're here and we're gonna play around and we're gonna try some stuff and it may work, it may not, um, but it's cool. And when we find out what it is and what thing is, then then we'll zero in on that and we'll play with it a little bit more. And so, did you, oh, sorry. Did you feel from a casting perspective that he was the right choice because he just, his natural t tone and his essence was just the character and so it was, yeah. Yeah, was, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. So then you like, we, just we have to give him. someone permission to be themselves basically yes exactly i just had to get a person to be himself in a room and to realize i'm not here to judge him and if he falls on his face mm -hmm. it's okay i'll fall on your face right along with you and we'll get back up and we'll figure it out 
Plus, we get multiple takes. Exactly. That's the beautiful part about <laughs> animation is that you can fall on your face all day long. And you know what? It's not, you're not, no one's going to be sitting there doing this like you're going to be on, a, on an on-camera set. I mean, obviously, we don't have all the time in the world, but we do have latitude to figure things out. Um, I know that you are uh, voice directing little Ellen, which is super cute. Um, and there's a ton of kids on that show. There is, yeah. How, what is um, your experience like directing um, children? How does it differ from directing grownups? Um, it's a vastly different experience and totally the same all at the same time. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's the same thing, is that kids smell being condescended to immediately. Mm. So I just try to talk to them in a way that, you know, I don't talk to them like an adult necessarily, but I talk to them in a way that's direct, that's authentic, that's authentic, that's sincere, and just, and have a conversation. And I try, and I've directed kids as young as three years old on up. Yeah. And so, uh, and in those, uh, no, uh, Summer Camp Island had a three-year-old. Um, I think the youngest we had on Ellen was maybe eight. Um, I actually really enjoy casting kids and talking to and directing kids because kids are going to phrase things in ways that I can't imagine. And there's a charm in that, that if I can get them to just be themselves and say things that they would just say just as in their brain. Yeah. That's, that's, that's gold. Cause that yeah. is just the charm of, of, of hiring a kid. That's why you would do it. And so if I can get them to do that and not try to sound like an adult, then I've done my job. Yeah, it's so interesting. Kids are just so magical. Yeah. <laughs> it really is hard to bottle. There's there's exactly. nothing like the little their little voices. Right. Right. If you create a good sandbox for them, oh my god, they'll give you gold. Yeah. My son and somebody came up to him at school and told him that he had a a, a weird voice. <laughs> you but, said, Thank you. I will do well with it in the future. I know. I was like, honey, you you're welcome here. This is this is yeah, your right exactly. place. Uh -huh. Weird is good. Um, so legendary voice director Andrea Romano said that voice casting was like baking the cake and voice directing is like eating the cake, which I love. Is that how, do you feel similarly about the distinction between casting and directing? Yeah, I mean, um, I get where she's going. I probably wouldn't use that same analogy just because I'm not a big sweets person. Um, really. <laughs> Do like, you know how many grams of sugar? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm already like, you know, having blood sugar problems thinking about the analogy. Um, no, it is, but it's similar. I mean, to me, it's, you, you put the pieces in order in casting. You build, you build, you know, for me, I would think of it more of like a, a music analogy that you're building this instrument okay. and you're like, you know, what happens if I take a tube of body, but maybe I take the reed from an oboe and then I, plug that into something that aims at a bass drum and okay let's hear that sounds and directing is hearing how it sounds and 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 seeing if all these pieces you put together that are disparate and maybe don't look like they're going to make something harmonious do and directing is creating that harmony and that's fun for me wow Ooh, i have to remember where this is in the clip because i that was <laughs> a magical little do you have a music background uh, I do, yeah. I mean, it's not, uh, Centaur World is far beyond the scope of my music background. Um, Megan Dong had a big uh, show musical background um, that she, she found did. in high school. I, I come from, you know, three chords and the truth in a garage. So that's about yeah. the extent of it. And so when they hired me, I was interviewing for it. They were like, you know, can you direct the musical sessions? I'm like, yeah, I can direct them to a point. And, um, and I said, can I see some of the music? I'm like, holy shit. No, I can't. I mean, like, I can tell you when, you know, when they're off key, but I can't see, I can't sing for shit. Yeah. So, but I can't come back and say, this is where they are off key. I can just say, you know, they're off key and, and on the spot here. And Megan's a wonderful singer. I'm like, so Megan, you might have to be able to say that. But the people that we cast in the show were Broadway singers. I didn't have to tell them anything. I just had to get out of the way. Yeah. Um, so then do you have the composer or somebody else in the room that's doing the musical directing or it's you and Megan? It's me and Megan. And we so have, cool. I, yeah. And if I have my druggers, I'll have an engineer who has a really good musical background. So we had an amazing engineer named Jordan King on there who worked for Out Loud Audio, who whenever I have any kind of musical heavy show, I try to use him because he's a Berkeley music graduate and he's nice. a choir boy. And so between the three of us and in, you know, he and I and whoever is on the show, we can typically make it work 
Yeah, that show is so fun. Um, yeah. Congratulations, by the way, on uh, just announced uh, season, season two is going to be airing yeah. December 7th. Seventh. Seventh. Yes. And um, it gets boner and weirder and better. It's such a great show. Does it? It's, yeah. I love that it's a family show. It's really something that like I can sit down and watch with yeah. my kid who's, yeah. I mean, yeah. he's only, he's not quite six, but also I feel, what is, I mean, is it, it was it pitched as a family show or is there a target like, is six to, you know, I'm kind of It's six to 11 is going to be the demographic that it was pitched for. Um, but I would argue that it is a show. I mean, I've had lots of people who come up to me and said, I'm so digging Centaur World and they have no kids. And uh, and they are grown ass adults. I almost felt like the marketing made me think it was for adults. Until oh, really interesting. Yeah, um, based on the billboards and stuff that were up, I was like, oh, this is a new like adult animated series. I mean, it kind of felt, I guess, like in the world of a Steven Universe or something like something. Yeah, I think teen. definitely. Yeah, for sure. But, yeah, yeah, and I think that the challenge with that show is is trying to because there's so two different worlds in that show is how do you promote that? How do you say this show, this war-torn world and this show of, you know, rainbows and silliness are all together in a short trailer? It's hard to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think once you get, once you we'll get, get into, into it. Show, oh yeah. Like, exactly. Oh yeah. Okay, so I'm glad you're a fan. Be one of those word of mouth things too. I yeah, think. It is. I'm happy to help spread the word. Yeah. I'm, Megan Dong is such a, an interesting and inspiring woman as well to get a show like that off the ground. Were you, uh, di did you come on board sort of during the pitch phase or were you brought on? I came on board right after, uh, no, later, later than the pitch phase, once it had been picked up and they were starting to develop the scripts, they hadn't gone to board yet. So it was all still very scripted, but she had done because she is a board artist and she has that background. She had done the entire first episode boarded and she scratched it all and she sang it all. So the oh. so when she pitched it to me, wow. she did the whole the whole thing. She showed me the whole first episode in the pitch and with the music, she like got her phone out and timed it with the animatics and said, okay, here it is. And she got it all going. And it was this, it was like the most amazing pitch I'd ever, I'd ever have. Cause I'm like, oh my God, this is such a full concept that you're pitching to me. I'm like, yeah, man, this is amazing. Wow. Yeah. And I'm like, so, you know, who you ever did, you never wrote your song, you should have in there. And she goes, well, you know, I, I wrote the song. I'm like, oh my God, these songs are amazing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And yeah, that comes from her, you said musical theater background in yeah. college or high school? Or high school. I thought you said high school, but then I was yeah. like, that math she started, Yeah, her story is kind of funny. She just got, her parents wanted her to go a certain route and she decided to take show choir instead. And um, and she just said, you know, it just changed everything for me. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. I love story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes the universe is just magic. It is, yeah. Um, you've gotten the chance to work with some amazing female creators, Chris Nee, Megan, you know, that really have awesome vision. Um, I was curious if you, do you notice um, a difference with the feminine energy that, um, is there any kind of um, difference that male creators and female creators bring to the table? Um, you know, the, yeah, it's different. I don't know if one is necessarily better than the other. Um, no, no. Sometimes, but yeah, but sometimes women will be a little bit more they'll be a little bit more aware of needing to raise the voices of women in the room mm -hmm. um, just because they are aware of that as someone who's been in that position. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not across the board. There's definitely been male creators I've worked with who are very much aware of the voice needing to raise the voices of, of people in the room that mm -hmm. um, haven't always had the chance to do that. Um, it, 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 it is, and it just depends on the confidence. You know, a lot of times it's about it's time my job to help give some women the confidence that they can do this job and that they do have the tools to do all that. Particularly where they're, Megan came in pretty confident at the beginning of it. Um, but a lot of times, you know, it's one of the things that I think that I can help a sh young showrunner do, Christine obviously was not this, she was very established by the time with you and I working together, but is, um, is to say, you know, trust me, I got your best interest in mind. We are going to make this work and mm -hmm. we are going to get good performances. But a lot of times it's getting them to just let go and trust. Mm -hmm. Across yeah. the board. No. It's interesting. There, you know, there's the 
a big movement that's say, you know, wanting to bring more feminine energy to politics. And we're seeing so much shift um, in America in the past couple of years, um, particularly with, you know, a representation for LGBTQ plus. And I know that you worked with Doc McStuffins, who I'm sorry, Doc McStuffins. <laughs> you worked with Chris. Yeah, sure, doc. <laughs> you worked with Doc. I hear mm -hmm. she's a really good doctor back when you mm -hmm. had the snippy mm -hmm. snippies. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, no, mm -hmm. it's who created, um, Christine, who created Doc McStuffins as well as Vampirina. And she once described trying to put LGBTQ content onto children's television as like a third rail. Um, and Disney didn't want to feature um, a same-sex lesbian couple in Doc McStuffins a few years ago. And she, now we're seeing so uh, much more representation. And I was curious, um, how do you view the changes specifically in children's entertainment between a, f a few years ago and now? Uh, it's amazing. So when Chris and I were working together, it would have been like, it would have been like 2015, 2016, around there. And, um, we uh and she made the comment about uh trying to get more representation um in general and we both agreed that yes we need to do better one of the things that we talked about and chris was the one who came up with this was she was trying to get glad to mm -hmm. uh to have a media awards just for children so if anybody doesn't know what glad is it's the gay and lesbian anti-defamation alliance who does a basically media watchdog to make sure that queer people in the media are well represented and mm -hmm. they do a big uh award show every year and and it's important, it's, it, it, it highlights people who have made big changes. So one of the things that they didn't have was a category for children's programming. We could submit, but Steven Universe would submit right alongside Transparent. And it's not a level playing yeah. field. Yeah. We can't say the word God in children's programming, much less gay. So to have, say that, you know, we've created this program and say, well, yeah, you compete along Transparent, who I'm like, we can't compete with those storylines. So Chris mm -hmm. reached yeah. out to GLAAD and said, hey, let's get our own programming. Let's get our own category. And they were like, no, no, you can compete. So we did it over and over again. So finally, Chris and I were in the middle of Amparina. We were like, we need to do better. We know enough queer people in this in animation community mm -hmm. to just to have, a commu have a conversation. So we did. Chris and I and a bunch of people reached out and we created a conversation amongst the queer people in animation and said, we need to not stop. We need to stop asking and just start doing. And so that for me meant casting more queer people. And, and for Chris, it meant writing more characters. And for whoever it was in their position, it meant just putting a bigger spotlight on it. So we ultimately got glad to create a children's programming category, which after three or four meetings, they finally heard us and they did it. And that first year was 2018. And that was Andy Mack that won that year. And then in 2019, Steven Universe won. So last year during the pandemic, I got a call from Business Insider, who's two, Abby White and uh, Callie Chick were two writers who were doing, they put together a database of all the queer characters in the history of animation. And they said, do you mind you know, doing an interview about it? And we're going to do this little pre-interview and we're going to show you what we're going to do. And I'm like, okay, sure. So in the pre-interview, they show me this graph of the history of queer characters in animation starting uh -huh. in 1999. And it's like two, three, four. In 2018, there's like seven. And that's the first year that they had the award. In 2019, after the award, there was 71. And when they showed this to me, I'm in there and I'm just like, you know, having this conversation. It took my breath away. I started to cry. And... I had no idea the impact we could have if we just created an award and made recognition for studios to want to be recognized for their work. And that was, and I don't think, and I'm not gonna take complete, but Glad Award didn't do all of that for sure, but it did make a big movement on it. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a very personal, dear to my heart thing to see queer characters in animation. I'm still part of the uh, Glad Children's Programming Committee. We meet a couple of times a year and it's a very big effort to continue to keep up the amount of representation as much as I can. <sighs> Goosebumps. Mm, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's wow. And to be able to see that visual graph. Well, I yeah, it was stunning. Time. When I, I mean, it literally like, I just, I just stopped and everything was in, cause I, you just, you know, you keep plugging along, fumbling along, you say, okay, more core characters, great, more core characters, yeah. great. And then you see it, it just, it's crazy. Exponential, and I'm so I'm so curious to see what 2021 is going to fall in that graph. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, in a completely uh, 
Well, Segway. maybe not completely in a in a different uh, category or maybe more of the same. Um, I did have one of my fans, Hunter, ask if you could have any superpower. What superpower would you choose? Um, I think I would choose the ability to um, just dematerialize, materialize someplace else. Like if I could just basically de-atomize right here and then atomize, like say, like in Paris right now, wouldn't that be great? You could do your transcendental meditation in Bali. Right? And then come back and do a session in Los Angeles. I feel so refreshed. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. <sighs> evolved I would be by that? Yeah, well, you kind of already are a superhero. You're already mm. changing lives <laughs> within media. Um, yeah, that would be a fun one. Uh, yeah, I can, um, I'm trying to think what mine would be, but like, it's just really even hard to, to fathom. I mean, I guess it would, yeah, maybe be able to like, well, flying's good. It's hard to choose. <laughs> I know. Just know. One. Hard to choose. I know. Yeah. But um, if I could, you know, just basically pop wherever I wanted to. I know on. that. I know. I didn't want to like copy you, but I think that might be my dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, David Mar Marshy is on here. You know, um, Rebecca Sugar is actually one of the people we get the most requests to have on the show. So people, people are just absolutely in love. I was also curious to talk a little bit about Infinity Train. It has such a, sure. cult, such a cult following. And um, when did you get involved with that project? And what was it like working on there? What were your experiences? Um, Infinity Train was great. So um, that was another one where... Again, I could see uh, Owen Dennis came from Steven Universe, um, the creator of the show, and I could definitely see some of that thoroughfare through all of that. Um, it was a, a wonderful show because it was, it's an anthology series. So, you know, we did 10 episodes and in many ways we were done. And then we would do another 10 and we were done. Uh, Owen was really adamant that he wanted the performances to be kind of raw at times. And mm. if you look at particularly that first uh, chapter or book of it, when we have the, um, the characters with the mother and the daughter going at it in the room where they, Ashley Jensen, uh, sorry, Ashley Johnson. And then um, we had uh, Audrey Wazalewski who, who, who has her mom. And that would uh, allowed us to create two very good actors to go have this very raw moment of a mother and daughter just going at it. And so we, when we recorded that, both Owen and I were like, we need to, these, have, these actors need to be in the same room. They need to feed off each other. We needed this whole scene um, live. And so we did. And, and when I, so we ran it all. And, I, and as you know, in animation, you're not supposed to step on each other's lines. You're supposed to create a little bit of a beat so that an actor in editing, we can move the lines around. So there's no, there's no editing has to matter to move things around. So we did it that way first. And then I just turned to the engineer and I said, we're going to step on each other's lines and we're going to record. It's like we're going to do a two shot in a live show and we're just going to let them go. And that's the take that ended up going into the show because it was, by that time, they were just so raw with so much emotion that it was, again, captured something magical. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of it was just really, I mean, the, uh, the performances I got to create in the Vinny Train were some really wonderfully strong, powerful. And I've had other showrunners in the in job since and saying, so um, we're looking to create kind of performances like Infinity Train. And I'm like, okay, great. Right. <laughs> well, here's my resume. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You know, yeah, I'm mildly familiar with that. Thing. Now, I heard he wanted to go eight seasons, that he was hoping to go for eight and you guys went yeah. for four. Is that right? Yeah, he definitely had, I mean, there was definitely more stuff scripted. I don't know how much Owen has, I know he's been pretty vocal about it. I don't know how much he's leaked about um, what, where it was planning on going, um, but it was mm. fun, where it was planning on going, things that they were doing. Uh, yeah, and, and, the, and the chapter that it ended on was definitely not the one I think that Owen would have preferred it to end on. Um, it was kind of the lighter one since we came off of uh, book three, which was so dark, we did something kind of lighter for the fourth one. And uh, it would have, I think, it was an odd place for it to end, but you know. Yeah. You, like you never know. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You never know. Yeah, you never know. We'll see. The future yeah. of, you know, fans have more and more influence and as streaming opens up, I don't know. I don't want to keep you guys uh, praying for more, but. Mm -hmm. um, so Kippo, what a crazy yeah, show. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. a crazy show. Also, um, timing wise, like I was watching that during the pandemic and it, there was times where oh, like, yeah. oh, 
Oh yeah, the Los Angeles shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Right now is too. I gotta. I, <laughs> I was like, it's really like I feel like it's mirroring my life right now or something. It was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a fun one though, but that was one of those oh. shows. So Red Seacrest was the showrunner on that, and he came to me with a. You know, that was one where we did talk a lot. I did not do the casting; I just did the directing on it. But definitely, I was like, "There's some sensibilities here that I think would work with the way I cast." And so there were some suggestions that um, that I made that showed up in the casting on that. But there was just this wonderful kind of punk rock Los Angeles vibe to it that I liked and and I kind of grew up in that scene so that was something that I really enjoyed being able to lean into and Brad was totally good with that and so the more that we kind of worked and and he allowed me to kind of have the latitude to do some of the ad-libbing that I would do with actors to get them to open up and and take a scene and and just throw little bits of their own personality in there. Coy Stewart, who voices Benson character, did a ton of that. And that was something that really, I think, made the show special. And were you working off mainly, were the, how, how much in the process were the storyboards? Would you, would you it, have, or no, were you- It was all scripted. For them? Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. because, the, I mean, the visuals on that show were just so- I know, amazing. Right? Next level, stunning. Yeah. Um, I'm always intrigued. I, I'm very curious about how that show was pitched to and... Yeah, I, well, because it was started out as a web comic. So you saw some visuals from that. So Rab, Rab had that as a web comic. So you could see some of that. And then he kind of expanded it into kind of a proof of concept, but that was about it. And then, so we went really into the first episode in the pilot with it, just with some artwork and everything else was... was I gotta kind say, of good Netflix there. making some real wins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was a that was a good one. Yeah, that was a DreamWorks and Netflix, but it was and DreamWorks had to take you know the um, the, the a leap of faith on that one because that's a very original IP and they had to kind of let the trust that Brad knew what he was doing because he's also a short, first time showrunner that he could make something you know that that weird work and totally right. they were like it's rad. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah, what did, see what did I tell you? I'm like a. <laughs> <laughs> my my sound machine is kind of broken. Um, yeah, like a comic from the. <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, we uh, only have about ten minutes left or so, so I want to uh, maybe go to a couple fan questions. Sure. If you guys have anything? Um, I did have a question come in from S N Dorman, which I couldn't. I not, I didn't come up with this in my research, so I was curious. Have you ever done any voice acting? Um, not really. I'm not a big fan of uh, being on the other side of the glass. Um, I'm really, really kind of a shy person in general. So the idea of performing it, no, it terrifies me. <laughs> um, so it gives me, so I have a lot of respect for the amount of vulnerability an actor has to be in to do it, because I don't necessarily have the guts to do it. But mm -hmm. I, so I really do try to create a space that allows them to, to show that, yeah, I want you to be vulnerable um, and I get that it's hard. So let's make it safe for you to do that. Do you have siblings? I have two older brothers. Two older brothers. Interesting. Yeah. I'm always curious about how birth order influences kind of the what, desire what to be safe. You, what, <laughs> what? what theories have you come up with as to how that, that? A lot of performers are older children. Really? Eldest children. And um, there's something like that sibling comes along. And you're like, mom and dad, look at me. Oh, interesting. Um, kind of uh you know I, it, I mean I see it in myself and I've had a lot of conversations with people over the years it's like then when your parents attention is diverted away you you have your coping me mechanism is to kind of perform yeah. so and then it just becomes second nature part of your you know shtick or whatever but yeah huh I'll have to I, I, I'm gonna ask more questions about that now because I never thought about that but that makes total sense and then it becomes about spending the rest of your, your acting career trying to tear apart that need to please your parents, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's not right. healthy. <laughs> That's a complicated relationship. So, yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, well, guys, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the box. Um, I, we only have a couple minutes left, but I'll see if I can get to maybe one or two. Um, also, uh, I wanted, you know what, this is uh, kind of crazy because... So you worked on, um, that's so funny. Well, we didn't even talk about We Bear Bears. We can. Um, do you want to talk about We Bear Bears? Sure. Because yeah. it's also, it's interesting. We Bear Bears, so we're seeing a through line of like 
um, really advocating for diversity in casting. And We Bear Bears is like, an, didn't they win some awards for um, really uh, being kind of the voice of um, for diversity and um, the show creator? So Dave Chong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it was it was important to Daniel for sure um, to have a diverse cast for us to always. Uh, to cast as diversely as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and Daniel and I learned a lot, I think, together on that show because both of us felt the same way. And there's times when we realized we could do better. And so we really pushed each other, I think, to do better as much as possible to make sure that when we cast, you know, queer characters, that we actually cast from the queer community um, oh. or things like that. Um, you know, and there been, was a horrible... Um, okay thing that uh, casting directors would do for a long time is that they would cast for an Asian character. They would say, well, the character is Korean. I'm like, well, they're Japanese. And then I'll be like, that's close. I'm like, no, let's not do that anymore. Let's, let's be authentic with our casting to, you know, to the character and, mm -hmm. to, and to make sure we do that correctly. So yeah, I think that Daniel and I really pushed each other to make sure that we were as authentic as possible on all aspects of We Bear Bear. And, they, and we both knew that the vulnerability and sincerity was the only way that show was going to work. And so we had to really find a way to make that happen. When you were doing a lot of shows for Cartoon Network, did you have like an office you went into? <laughs> I didn't. They offered it to me at one time. Um, but I have been a freelancer since the day I started. And, okay. uh, and it just, it scared me. And I was like, no, I'm okay. I'll stay in the green room with my laptop. It's fine. It just seemed like, you know, you were. I was, I was definitely there for a long time. And they definitely made some, you know, some really wonderful um, accommodations for me. There was definitely a room that I would go to that was rarely used. It was, it was a shorts program at Cartoon Network. And they have their own little pitch room. And if they weren't in production, I would be in there most of the time. But no, like, pictures on the walls. <laughs> no, no, it was definitely a very much me transitory through all of that. I was not going to be there for a long time. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, just your, like, meditation cushion, like, in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there was definitely, in the green room, I would come in between shows, and you could, more often than not, you could find me napping on my couch right before the 2 o'clock session. And did you also work with Eric Rogers? I haven't worked with Eric Rogers. No. Oh, okay, okay. I, he's coming on the show next week. If anybody is... Uh, um, it, Curious, Eric Rogers is going to be on the show next week, writer and show creator. So tune in for that. We're at 6 p.m. the normal time. Um, Epic Voice Guy says, I got to audition for both shows at some point. That's nice. Awesome. Um, well, Sonic the Fidget Spinner asks, how hard is it to have a big cartoon crossover? Because he's, he or she or they are seeing a lot more recently. Um, you know what? Um... Uh, the person who's woven words is one of my favorite people in the world. Thank you, Susan. Um, uh, the cartoon crossover, you, it, it is hard. It, you know, a lot of people want to have um, a, a give a cartoon crossover, but you got to create a show that's really popular that people want to see well, not one show, but two shows that are really popular. And sometimes you do it and people hate it. Like, you know, they did... Um, what was the thing that Pete Longerton did with, uh, he did, so Uncle Grandpa and Steven Universe had a crossover and people hated <laughs> it. So, um, and they assumed that, that Rebecca was forced to do it and Rebecca's like, no, I asked Pete to do it. So it, it, it's oh. tough because sometimes you do it and, and people think that these two worlds shouldn't like, combine. It's like those fighting fish too. It's like, they're like perfect yeah, exactly. and grown. You put them together. Yeah, it's like, exactly. oh. Yeah, so it's tough. And, and it's hard to make it successful, I think, because sometimes those, those, Things work in their own worlds just fine. And you find them in the same world like they, they, you know, never the twain should meet. I'm sorry. We, that is not um, a question that we are going to work on because we've already kind of answered that. Uh, we already answered this. Um, well, I was, yeah. So Jeff Burns has an interesting question about just that transition. We talked about this a little bit at the top, yeah. but um, the fact that you, you know, made that transition from directing anime and dubs to them being one of the top directors in animation. Did you feel like it was a gradual process? Was there any point that you're like, oh, this is like really happening. This is the tipping point. Oh, for sure. Well, I don't know about believing that, but the, the making the jump from anime to original animation was a big jump that I had to take a leap of faith that I could do it. Um, I, it was one of those things where I, I really wanted to do it. 
And I, and so, and I was really voice directing at the time. I wasn't doing any casting. And so I go to interview for Clarence and this was my big chance. This is my chance to get into Cartoon Network and to make this leap into original animation and get out of anime, get anime and video games. And I go and I interview and, and they're like, okay, so this is great. We want to hire you as voice director and you do casting as well, right? And I was like, yeah, I do casting as well. Totally. I had never done any casting before in my life. And oh, really? so, yeah. <laughs> and so, but I knew that I wanted to do the job so much that I would figure out whatever gaps in my knowledge and I would work hard and I'd make it happen. Oh, so wow. I had to just take a leap of faith that although I didn't have a hundred percent of the skill sets they were asking for, mm -hmm. that the gap that I was missing was something that I'll figure out and I'll work and, and I'll, and I'll get there along the way. And I'm going to take some, you know, hits on the chins. I'm going to make some big mistakes, but, um, but I want it enough at all, but I'll make it work. And, and so it, yeah, exactly. Sometimes you just gotta fake it till you, yeah, you just gotta fake it till you make it. Yes. This is so great. Oh my gosh. I love that. Oh, I'm like so torn because I'm like, I want to ask even one more question, but like, that was such a high note, but just like uh, season four of infinity train, I'm going on. Um, okay. We talk about that. We talk about that. This I thought was an interesting question. Um, although maybe your favorite show is just whatever you're working on right now. <laughs> ah, that is a hard Do you one. have a favorite show um, that you've worked on? No, I don't have a favorite show that I've worked on. I have favorite things about all the shows that I've worked on for mm -hmm. sure. Um, and, but there's no one show that I love any more than the others. There'll definitely be aspects of all the shows that there be something that I, that I really am proud of or, um, that make, makes it near and dear to my heart, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to be parts of it. Nothing as a whole that makes one stand out more than the other. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Hunter right. says, Allison has a lot of energy tonight. You know what? I am standing tonight, which is Are you? usually sit and I oh, am so over sitting. Nice. I want to get a t-shirt made that just declares my dislike of sitting period. Uh, <laughs> So over sitting. So I guess that's a yeah. good thing. I know it's yeah. it's a bit much, but um, can you tell it? <laughs> <laughs> We're also an hour later, so you know, getting a little True. punchy. Get that energy into it. Yep. My water here. Um, and then, did you? Can you tell us anything about what you're working on right now? Um. Yeah. So um, they're all. A lot of them have been announced. Um, I'm working on uh, the prequel to Gremlins, the animated prequel to Gremlins. Oh. Yes. Amazing. So, yeah. So that that okay. is uh far along and I think it will air sometime next year. Um I'm working on a uh a something that could I hope is successful. Um it's a big leap for animation. It's called Pantheon. It's by AMC. It is a complete a, adult animation but not but drama. So it are they're forty four minute episodes. Yeah, and um, and we did two seasons. I probably shouldn't announce that. We did one season. The second will be announced one more later. Um, but uh, yeah, um, and it is. I mean, we had the actors, and this is all been announced. So um, it's Paul Dano, it's William Hurt, it's um, it's it's a huge cast, and so it is something that is a stretch for animation. Can't, will Americans watch forty-four minutes drama of animation? Yes. As a series. I, I, I think, hope so. Look I at how so. well all anime is doing. And, exactly. You know? Yeah, I think it, I think it can. But, Death you know, we'll robots. see. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think it has the, the, the legs to do it. It's beautiful, what I'm seeing out of what I get, what, what is coming back, because we now are in the place of receiving for season animation. Um, it, they put a lot of money to it. They put a lot of effort into it. It could be a game changer for animation. I hope. Or a cautionary tale. Ah, well... Do we have a launch date? Did you say so? Um, I got to think it's probably in the fall of next year. Is what it is. That all is very fluid. Maybe yeah. we can have you back on when that comes out. Yeah. And do yeah, a little sure. powwow. Yeah. Because it's yeah. Uh, it's a crazy show. Like Aaron Eckhart's in the cast. Arcane. Is yeah. Chip Beam and yeah. Point. Arcane. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, the, like there is an audience for it. So right. I mean, they're not completely, you know, whacked and thinking that this might work. It's yeah. Just, no one's done it yet. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, Christy, this was awesome. I am so, Yay. so.
so grateful that you came on the show. I'm so grateful we had the chance to connect and hear your story and share it. And um, I'm super inspired and lit up. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all the people I see that are like, Spencer Rockwell's amazing. Thank you for doing this, Spencer. And that's yes! yes! amazing people. Thank you all for, for, for um, chiming in on all this. Yes, I know. Um, we do, because this show gets, re the audio gets rebroadcast later as a podcast. Since I started doing that, there's less, you know, interaction and like that fun. Sure, it's, yeah. it's a fine balance to strike. Um, sure. But guys, we are so grateful that you are here. You are what make the end sure. show. For sure. Thank you for doing so, it. So thank you for tuning in. Thank and you for next, asking me, Allison. Thank you. And next week we'll see you for Eric Rogers, Skylanders Academy. And um, thank you, Christy. Thank Bye. You.